Even though this is our last week of our One Hit Wonder series, I thought it would be important just to remind everybody what a One Hit Wonder is. It's one of those songs that hits big, but we know nothing else from that band. It just is a One Hit Wonder. It goes up the charts, and then it dies out, and we hear nothing else. And what's wild is the Bible itself, as we look at it, is 1,189 chapters made up of 66 books. But of those 66 books, five of them are just a single chapter. They were so important in and of themselves that they got their own book, their own little spot. And those are the five one-hit wonders that we've been looking at. And so today, we are going to be jumping into our final letter, and it is the letter of Jude. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to Jude. If it's on your phone, it'll be all the way at the bottom of your scrolling list. If it's in your Bible, it'll be all the way to the right-hand side. If you hit Revelation, just go back a couple of pages. So um, as you're turning there, how many of you have ever heard or used the phrase, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission? Anybody else use this? Okay, cool. This is a phrase that I loved when I was growing up, and I'll confess to you, sometimes I still do. Um, I love using this phrase when I want to do something that I know probably isn't the wisest thing to do. Now, as I was growing up, my parents, they followed Jesus. They were disciples of Jesus. And so I often knew that they would extend forgiveness as part of their um, obedience to Christ. And because of that, I would often disobey their commands, like chores or curfew or watching my language. And um, I would just say, well, they're going to have to forgive me. And I'll tell you, I felt like as a teenager, I got away with a lot. I got away with so much, and when I got busted, which did happen, um, I was quick to confess, yes, I did that, yes, I did those things, because I knew, yes, they loved me, I knew they loved me, and I knew they would forgive me. What I failed to realize is that their love for me also meant that they did not want me to continue to do what I was doing. Just because they forgave me and just because they continued to show patience, it didn't mean they didn't care about the way I was disobeying them, right? When it got rough, which it did, punishments came and they came hard and they came strong. And you know what I would do when they came? I would grumble and I would complain. I would whine and say, you know what? My favorite three words from every teenager, it's not fair, You've said them too. You, you didn't punish me last time. You know what? You just don't understand what it's like being a teenager now. If you loved me, you'd really let me do what I want to do. Please tell me I'm not the only one who did this. Please tell me I'm not the only one who's dealing with this right now. Okay, the, yeah, there's an amen. I see that. Right, as I look back at my teenage years, what I realize is I took my parents' love for me as a license to do what I wanted. Right? I, I could do what I want. I used their liberal forgiveness in my life to justify living excessively and doing what I felt like doing. And I, I know that some people might say, you know what, this is just part of growing up. This is what, what growing into an adult looks like. But I disagree. I disagree because I think that regardless of what we're told, there is this desire in every single one of us to find ways to justify doing what we already want to do even if we know it's not right. If we can find a way left to our own devices to do what we want, I'm just going to call it for what it is and say, I think most of us take it. We do. This is the idea and the heart behind the book of Jude. This very idea of, a, of, of being able to do what I want to do because God's grace is so great. And if you read the letter of Jude, which is just one chapter, what you find in this letter is it is rushed. It is not a really well-formed letter. It is a fired off really quick, I've got to get this right into the church. And Jude is writing to a largely Jewish church. And we don't know exactly where this church is, but we know that they're a largely Jewish church because of some of the references that the author author is going to make. And instead of working through the whole letter like we have with each of the other ones up to this point, we are going to kind of start at the beginning and hit a couple of places along the way um, to kind of get an idea, well, what, what should the church do if we find ourselves in this tension of 
I know what God wants, and yet I want what I want. And so I'm going to find a way to do this, because I still think we're there. But let's just start right off into the beginning at the greeting, because there's always been some fun things in each greeting. Jude 1 says this. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, what's interesting here is this is, uh, says it's from Jude. In the Greek and in the Hebrew, the reality is this name is not Jude. It's Judas or it's Judah. That's how this is. And, you know, that's what his real name is. It's Judah. And he describes himself in two ways. The first way, he says, I am a slave of Christ and a brother of James. If you're like a brother of James, there's another book in the Bible named James. Yeah, they're brothers. These guys are brothers. And you know what's really cool? What James tells us that Jude doesn't is James is a brother of Jesus. And Jude is another brother of Jesus. So we have a letter here from the very brother of Jesus. And I find it awesome that his first way of describing his relationship to his brother is, I am a slave of Jesus. Now, we have to take into account that if there is a sibling who can look at another sibling and say, yes, that's the Messiah, we should be paying attention. Okay, we should be paying attention. Now, Judah and James, they did not believe this the entire time they lived with Jesus, but there's something about seeing your brother brutally murdered and crucified on a cross, seeing him buried, and then rising from the dead and like eating dinner with you again, that goes, huh. I think there's something to what you're saying here. I think this is it. You are the Messiah, especially because as the oldest born son, come on, let's just be real for us middle kids and youngest kids. The first always walks around like that anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right. I said it. You firstborns. (laughs) Um, We need to pay attention. Like Judah really believes that his brother is the Messiah, and that's important. In verses 3 and 4, he continues with the purpose of the book. He says, Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once and for all to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Judah's saying to this church, listen, I was going to write something much longer to you, but I don't have the time. Because something is going down right now that needs attention, and it needs it quick. And you know what's going on is that there's some ungodly people who have, I like the way that they say, wormed their way into the church. And now they're in a position of teaching. And you know what the message is that Judah has such a big issue with? It's this. It's that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. This is what they're teaching to the church. This message right now has triggered Jude to go, I can't even write to you what I was going to write about because this teaching is so dangerous that if you don't root this out, there's going to be some problems here. That, that they're starting to believe that if God's grace is so marvelous, if it's so big, there's nothing I can't do that he won't cover. Well, is that true? You know, if I was looking for justification to do what I already wanted to do, this sounds real appealing, doesn't it? I mean, God's grace is sufficient. It's enough for me. We just sang about this, right? This is appealing. The church that Judah's writing to thinks so too. They bought in. And they bought in specifically around two areas. The first was how they handled their sexuality and their sexual desires. And the second was how they loved and how they treated each other. They wanted to justify and do what they wanted to do. And so they found a teacher who would help them understand God's grace will cover whatever you want to do. Don't just go for it. And what Judah says is so clear about these types of teachers. He says the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago. It sounds like such a weird little statement, but he says the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago. How God views and treats teachers like this and the people who follow them, there has been a pattern. If you start in Genesis and you run all the way through to Malachi, um, you find a pattern of how God treats people who just do what they want and ignore his commands. 
And if they missed it before in their reading of these Old Testaments, Judah's going to make sure that they understand. Listen, I'm going to give you a crash course on the fact that God will not stand against this. And verses 5 to 16 are this, um, it, it's a bunch of Old Testament stories. And these are a little commentary. It's like a Jewish commentary. And in their tradition, this is known as a midrash, okay, a midrash. And um, what Judah's going to do is he's going to pull from a bunch of different stories, and he's also going to pull from some religious writings that they all would have known and understood that we don't currently have today. But they were religious writings that they had. So there are some stories in here that are like, hmm, I don't get it. That's okay. They understood this for the time. And what he's going to prove is simply this. God's grace is extensive. It is unbelievable. But he does not and will not put up with unrepentant sin for long. We don't need to read it all. But a quick summary of what Judah says. In verse 5, he uses the story of Exodus. And he talks about how God's grace was with the Israelites as they left Egypt. And even when they disobeyed God, when they were running through the desert, they allowed fear, drunkenness, their own sexual desires to be their gods. And so what did God do? He destroyed the disobedient so that the people, when they moved into the promised land, would be healthier. In Genesis 6, there's a story that Judah mentions about, um, it's a really weird one, about how um, the angels that were around, that, that they would go, and again, it's a, it's a very awkward story to kind of talk about, but the angels that were there were disobeying God's moral law and sleeping with the women of earth, and God said, this is not acceptable, and so because of that, you need to be judged, and these angels were judged. There's a reference in Genesis 19 and verse 7 um, to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, uh, you know, a city that's filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Um, it became so toxic that they were raping kids for pleasure and joy. And, and God destroyed that city in such grand fashion that we still talk about that today. It was meant to prove a point about how he feels about rampant sin. And in verse 11, in Judah talks about Cain and how Cain, um, instead of worshiping God, he was fueled by jealousy, he was fueled by rage, he kills his brother. And so what does God do? God places a curse on him, a sign on him that he said, you're going to have to live with this curse because this was disobedience, this was murder, but no one's going to be allowed to kill you or they're going to get cursed. I need you to live with the penalty of this. You don't get to get out of that. Uh, in verse 11, there's a story that he references from Numbers uh, 22 to 24 about a, a prophet named Balaam. This guy, all he did um, was he, was he was a prophet, but he was only a prophet for hire. If you paid him enough, he would curse people for you, or he would tell you what you really wanted. He heard from God, but you had to pay him to get it, and uh, it was just not real good. God ends up killing him uh, for his greed and his dishonesty, and you find this tension that exists in the Old Testament with him, and he's referenced all over the place. And then in number 16, um, there's another story in verse 11 mentioning a guy named Korah. Korah was a guy who di completely disobeyed Aaron and Moses when they were walking through the desert. He kind of stood up, and he's like, you guys are the worst. I don't want to follow you and then he got everybody in the camp to rally each other and they were like you're the worst and Moses and Aaron are like we don't know what to do God we don't know what to do and God's just not going to have the disobedience of his leaders at that time and so the earth opens up underneath Korah and his clan swallows them whole closes up because God will not deal with this type of injustice disobedience Judah goes example after example after example and I think he could have kept going if it wasn't a rushed letter. And the most important thing for us to understand is, is this. God's love is not a license. God's love for us is not a license to do whatever we feel like doing. His forgiveness that he extends, his grace that he gives to us does not give us the right to practice. It does not justify our excessiveness on how we want to live. Salvation that we find through Jesus Christ does not mean that anything goes now. You were saved, so feel free to do what you want. We cannot, as followers of Jesus, just indulge in every desire that we have and let selfishness take over and let our hearts lead our lives. That is not the way of the Scriptures. And the church 
that Judah's writing to bought into this hook, line, and sinker. They were fooled into thinking, you know what? If grace covers everything, doesn't that mean we can do anything? Paul writes about this in Romans 6, and he's like, since God's grace abounds all the more, shouldn't we just sin to show how graceful God is? It's like, <gasps> logically, I would love to do that. But that's not the call of Christ. That's not the call of Christ. I mean, if God's grace is so great, come on, he doesn't really care about what I do with my body, how I treat my body. He, he's going to overlook the times that I really feel like indulging in my sin or my sensuality, that I desire this sexually. He's not going to care. I mean, his standards are his standards, but whatever. Listen, yes, Jesus absolutely died for our sins. This is the grace that is extended to us, the mercy through Christ. But this does not mean that everything the Bible has to say about sin then goes out the window. Let me say that again just in case because I think a lot of us sit in a place where um, I'll follow Jesus, but I don't need his rules. I don't need his commands or his laws. Just because we have chosen and decided to follow Jesus, that does not mean that everything that's in the Bible and what it says goes out the window. It actually becomes more of a guideline for us. The truth is, as followers of Jesus, we must conform our lives to Scripture rather than twist Scripture to suit our lives. I've said this three weeks in a row. It's not because I have nothing better to say. It's because it keeps coming up in what we're reading. Can you see a theme in the early church that they were wrestling with? They didn't take Scripture seriously, so they would do what they wanted to do to get what they wanted. We don't get to define sin on our own standards. We don't get to define what truth is. God's grace does not change his moral authority. Okay? God's grace does not change his moral authority. The one truth that we see when we start in generation, or Gen Genesis and we move all the way to Revelation is that God will not let evil win. He will not. He will always bring about evil's defeat. And so this teaching that is entering into the church, if it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's a huge deal. And God not letting justice or you know, evil stand is the definition of justice, that things will be made right. And so these teachers are going to be held accountable. And Judah knows what's going to happen. When, when this letter is read, do you know what you're going to get when you read a letter like this to a church? Well, verse 16. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their own desires. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. When you tell people that scripture is scripture, you have to obey what this says, not what you feel like. You get grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining. You know what that is? You know who has that voice? It's the voice of the unempowered. The voice of people who will not make change in their life that would rather sit and moan about it and say, you know what, I don't want to change things. And when they can't get their way, verse 19 just goes on to say, when they can't get their way, they just start causing division all over the place because if they can start causing division, they'll find enough people who want to agree with them. And if they can find the people who want to agree with them, fine, we'll leave this, we'll start our own thing. And so what do you do then with people like this? What do you do? Well, that's up to God. He's taking care of that. But what do we do for people who have been deceived? People who have believed that you can just do whatever you feel like it. Judah writes some of the most beautiful and challenging, in my opinion, encouragements to the church. In verse 20, it says this. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Before you look out for other people who are deceived, we've got to kind of pause and look at each other, look at our own selves. And the three key steps that Jude lays out, he says, you've got to build up, right? You've got to build each other up. We need each other. Let's just be real. We need each other. So build each other up in the holy faith. When you see something awesome that someone has done that looks like Jesus, encourage it, bless it, talk about it, celebrate it. The second thing he says you got to do after you build up is you got to pray. 
We need to be going before God through the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I so want to do what I want to do. I am battling with this. And then we're building each other up saying, I feel what you feel. Would you pray for me in the power of the Holy Spirit that I would have the authority to not do what I know God is saying. This is going to destroy you, not benefit you. I've set that up for your goodness, but we need to pray for each other. Ask God for the power through the Holy Spirit to make the best decisions that we can, to take the best steps. And then the hardest step is to wait. None of us like waiting, do we? We don't like waiting, but we need to wait. And what are we waiting for? That verse says we wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to wait because you and I will fall. We will sin. And when we are building each other up, when we are praying for each other, we will wait to be reminded all the time that yes, you are forgiven. Yes, God's grace extends to this. We will not hide sin. We will expose it and we will proclaim it, not in a great way, but in a confessional way so that we can receive forgiveness. This is going to help us stay rooted. And it's from this place that we can begin to help other people who are struggling, just like it says in verse 22. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. You know what our role is when we see someone struggling? Go yell at them and kick them while they're down. Oh, sorry, that's just the way the church operates. My bad. We're supposed to show mercy. We're supposed to be the ones who look like Jesus extending a hand to say, I don't understand, but we're here together in this. We will walk together. You know this is off, and God's not going to let this stand, but we, can we do this together? Can we walk together? Can we do this? If we're building each other up through prayer and reminding each other of God's mercy in our own life, then it would be natural for us, like Jesus, to remind and show each other about God's mercy. And remember, this is directed at the church, not people outside the church. We're called to watch out for each other. And remind each other that no one is too far lost. No one is too far gone. And in verse 23, he says, Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sin that contaminates their life. Now this verse right here, I just want to tell you this. This is what's so often used by Christians to go around hating and excluding people. This is a verse that has been so taken to say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to love the sinner but hate the sin. Come on. That's just a, that's a garbage catchphrase we use to justify pushing people away from us we don't like. That's what we do. And I'm just going to call it for what it is. Call a spade a spade there. This verse has so much more involved in it that I wish I could dive into. And in the context of what Jude is writing, he's basically going to say this. You need to use caution. When you're around people outside the church, use caution. He doesn't say avoid them. He doesn't say ostracize them. He doesn't say push them aside or hate on them or yell at them. He says use caution when you're around them. And the image that he uses in the rest of this is kind of like someone who is clothed in white, which he references from you know, one of Peter's letters, that, that they are a robe covered in white. And what you need to be very careful of is you know the sin that you struggle with, which might be different than mine. And if you find yourself struggling with someone or with something, and then you intentionally put yourself around people outside the church who say this kind of sin is okay, guess what you're going to get on your white robe? smudges it's going to get soiled it's going to be on there and so a group that i may be able to hang out with like you know when i was in high school it was horrible for me to hang out with people who cursed all the time do you know why because i cursed all the time and i couldn't guard my language it was so hard and even when i felt convicted going this is not the ideal do you know what i did i put myself with those people i'm gonna reach them for jesus no that was i just liked hanging out with them because it gave me a justification to use you know the f-bomb is like a noun verb adverb adjective uh, you know pick it i could use it it was great I, I i struggled with that but some of my other friends did not have that same struggle who followed jesus and so they could find themselves with those people if you find that you struggle with sexual temptation, just why? Why would you put yourself on certain social media platforms? Why would you put a computer in your room or hide it? Why would you message that person on DMs and think, ah, oh, it's not going to be that big of a deal? Why would you go watch that movie with your friends if you know there's nudity in it and you struggle with that? You're putting yourself in a place that you're going to get smudged on. You're thinking, you know... God will forgive me if I sin. Yes, he will. 
that's really cheap. If your marriage is struggling, do me a favor. Stop hanging out with people who are divorced and celebrate it like it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. Very few divorced couples that I have walked with and counseled have said, this was the best thing that happened in my life. Their kids think it's even better. Fight for your marriage. Get the counseling you need. Pray to God that he could bring restoration. This is what the gospel is about. Don't sit and celebrate it like it's the best thing in the world. It is hard. You see, cross I think too often we put ourselves in the stupidest situations and we justify it by saying, but God will forgive me. And we cheapen his grace. Why do we do this? Well, because we don't like it when we can't do what we want. And it would be much easier to justify our own sin and find ways out and we cheapen God's grace. Your issue, issues are yours to manage, so I can't say, don't go out and have a beer. That's not my conviction. That may be yours, so don't do that. But if you're someone who struggles with alcohol, and I, uh, let me just say this on the side, this isn't even here. If there's ever been just one person who has said to you, you might have a drinking problem, that's enough. That, that's enough to pay attention and say, maybe I need to do something about this. Please, we'll help. We will help. Is it sexual addiction? There's, there's groups to help with that. You don't have to do this alone. But the problem is, the church has not been the place that extends mercy. We're the place that shoots our own wounded. Crossbridge, can we be a place that extends the grace to each other that God extends to us? But we have to be very careful not to cheapen it. And this was something that there was a German pastor, and I'll close with this quote. Um, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was alive during World War II, and he, he calls this type of, I'll just do what I want. I'll just, I'll just, it's, Sin, and then God will forgive me because he's so graceful. He calls this cheap grace. And in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, this is what he says. He says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without the requirement of repentance. Baptism with the church, or uh, baptism with church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace. Costly grace is the gospel in which we must be sought, which must be sought again and again. The gift which must be asked for. The door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Ooh. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Crossbridge, there is a cost to following Jesus. And when we declare, I've decided to follow Jesus and there's no turning back, that means we take what he said seriously and we apply it to our lives. This is the standard we hold each other accountable to. I know that that's a tough one hit wonder. But if you ever find yourself listening to a teacher who says you could do what you want, it's not that big of a deal. God's grace extends to it. They're only halfway right. God's grace absolutely extends. And he is so loving and forgiving. But it's not okay. It's cheapening what Christ has done for us. And so we are called to something different. And what I am so grateful for at Crossbridge is every single week we end in communion where there is a problem in our life of sin that separates us from God and instead of just cheapening it, going, ah, no big deal, we remember that repentance is part of our tribe. It's part of what we do here that we say, I have sinned. And it doesn't just, we don't say it so that it's like, oh, I'm the worst. We say it because the grace is, it's forgiven, amen? It's forgiven. Does it mean you won't struggle with that later? No, if you figure out how to do that, help me, teach me. <laughs> but we need this every week to come around a table to celebrate 
the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is where we find hope. And at Crossbridge, we celebrate an open table, meaning regardless of what tribe you are from, if you have dedicated your life to Jesus, you believe that he is the son of God and, and do all that you can to adhere to his teachings and try to line your life up with what he says and you obey that. This table is for you to celebrate his body and his blood. If you've not dedicated your life to Christ and you're still figuring this out and you're like, I just, no, nah, I'm not there. Please do not take communion. It's a very sacred act that scripture says, you do this without being in the right place, without fully confessing and repenting, you're eating and drinking your own condemnation. I don't want to say that, but it's what scripture tells us. How is your heart this morning? Are you justifying sin in your life? If you are, I want to invite you to confess. I invite you to repent of that and say, God, I, I'm struggling with this. Would you help me? And then go and take communion. Because this is what it's all about. Would you stand with me as we prepare our hearts? Jesus, you are good and kind. And you are serious and stern. You don't let us get away with things, not because you're so strict, but because of your great love. Sometimes we don't always experience the penalty of what we're, we've, we've chosen to do because not because you don't see it, but because your patience is so good. You're hoping to turn us, that we'll turn repentance. And so thank you for your patience and your kindness with us. And thank you for the gift that you've given us on the cross as we receive communion today. Holy Spirit, would you reveal in us where we need to repent so that we would be right with you, Jesus. Amen. At this time, feel free to grab a cracker and you could dip it or one that's prepackaged. Come back and we will celebrate communion together.